Right, so let's see how this works. Remember, seven columns first of all. What I've done here is just so it's easier for us to see is I've slapped them up already. So we've got our seven columns. We have a column for the years, we have a column for the description, one for the cash flows, two for discounting and the present values at 5% and two for 10%. So once we've got those, then it's simply a case of banging the numbers in. Remember, we have three cash flows. We have the market value. That's the value today. Once we've got that, we've got the interest. And finally, we have our redemption value. Well, OK, let's have a look-see. In year zero, well, that's our market value. Um, we are told that we had debt worth £102. Now, this may confuse, but the way we always do these calculations is to make the market value today an outflow and the interest and the redemption value an inflow. You could argue that we were looking at it from the wrong perspective there, because what we're doing is we're effectively looking at it from the debt holder's perspective. But the reason why we do it that way is because maybe it makes it more easy to interpret the results. And it doesn't matter which way around we do it to get the IRR. Once we've got that, interest, five years. And if we're looking at the interest, it was 10% of $100. So we take 100, multiplied by 10%, that's 10, and then we multiply by 1 minus t, 1 minus the tax rate. If the tax rate is 30%, presumably the other bit, the bit that we want, or at least the bit that we're paying, is the other 70%. So our interest is 7 each and every year. Then we look at our redemption value. The redemption value is a single value in year 5. We're told here that we redeem at par, 100. So, just satisfy yourself that you're happy where these numbers come from. Okay, we had, as we saw before, 102 pounds, 5 years, 30%, 10%, it's all there somewhere. Now. So, we have our cash flows. And after that, it is pure routine. We already know how to play with our tables. What we want are the discount factors. And I've suggested that we don't even think about this. We discount at 5% and at 10%. Because we would generally expect any form, of, any form of cost of debt to be somewhere between that range. And if it's slightly to the outside of below 5 or slightly above 10, that's not a big issue. We can cope with it. Right, so discount factors at 5%. I can do year zero, no problem. Five years at 5%. We get a discount factor of something like 4.329. Check, it's in your annuity tables. Year five at 5%, 0 0.784. And we do the same for 10% whilst we're there. Discount factors of one, 3.791 and 0.621. Get used to using your tables in order that you can bang these numbers out without even thinking. We multiply across. Minus 102. Then we get something like 30.30. And we get something like 78.4. We multiply across at 10%. Minus 102. We get something like 26.54, and we get something like 62.1. Therefore, well, if we look at our present values at 5%, if we net them all off, what do we get? Well, we get 108.7 minus 102 comes to 6.7, and that's positive. And then at 10%, what do we see? Well, hold on a moment. If we're taking 88.64 away, 88.64, what's that? 13.36, negative. 
And so we've sort of got what we want. We've got what we want in terms of we have a, a positive and a negative value. And of course, we already know the discount rate. With those four pieces of information, we can just throw this into the IRR formula and see how it pans out. As you should remember, when we're calculating the IRR, remember that gives us KD. When we calculate IRR, we take L plus bracket NL over NL minus NH multiplied by H minus L. Let's just check that we're all absolutely happy where these values come from. Do you remember the four components we had above? Well, presumably, this is L, the lower discount rate. This is H, the higher discount rate. This is NL, the net present value at the lower rate. And this is NH, the net present value at the higher rate. OK? So that's where the information is coming from. So we've got our formula here. L was 5%, wasn't it? Plus NL, 6.7. Over NL, 6.7 minus NH. Be careful here, NH is 13.36 negative. Remember, two negatives make a positive. I remember that, that uh, two wrongs make a right. Yeah. We multiply by H, 10, minus L, 5. And what do we come to? Well, the numbers almost sing out for us here, because I think we find that it's almost exactly, almost exactly, don't hold me to it, 6.7%. Uh, and we've established our cost of debt. Remember, this is work three or absolute max, four marks. And from that perspective, you're just going to have to bang the numbers out. There's no time to think. There's no time to be really fancy about this. So I really want you to know what rather than why. To recap, what have we done here? Well, firstly, what we did was to get the pro forma across the top. You know you need seven columns. You might as well get them all out to begin with. Then we've identified our cash flows. Given that we've identified our cash flows, we can get both the years and the cash flows that relate to them. Once we've got that, then we discount to get our net present values. And then finally, we slap it into the formula that we have here, and we get a result. No thinking required. Well, OK, let's move on with this knowledge and see where it takes us. Because, of course, we have to be ready for the bits and pieces, the bits on the periphery here. We have a further example. And what I want to do before we do anything else with this example is to simply practice doing it the manner in which we've done it already. For example, example 14, Rafa, the 10% loan notes, 10%, we're happy with that, are quoted at $120 x int. Fine. Presumably that's the current market value. Corporation tax is 30%. And they will be redeemed at a premium of $20 over par in four years' time. Well, OK. What is the net of tax cost of debt? And firstly, we want to use the redeemable debt calculation. Well, OK. Let's not think. Thinking is bad. All I want you to do is to, to do precisely what we did a moment ago and see if you can do the steps that are necessary. Well, OK. I wonder what you managed to do. Remember, in year zero, we have our current market value. If we look at our current market value, the cash flow, well, we say it's an outflow, 120. Then we look at our interest. Focusing on our interest, what do we have? Well, they're 10% loan notes. So 10% of 100 gives us 10, multiplied by 1 minus t, Yes, the tax rate is 30%, therefore, the net of tax interest is 7. 
And this runs for four years, one through four. So not difficult at all. Once we've got that, then we go for, well, in year four, we have a redemption value. And if we look at our redemption value, we're told it's redeemed at a premium of $20 over par. Well, if par's $100, par plus 20 gives us 120. And that may be of interest in a moment, but I really don't want to refer to it until we get there. So, we've done steps one and two. We've got the pro forma out, and once we've got that, we've thrown in the cash flows. Notice, outflow for the market value, inflow for interest and redemption value. That's just the way we do things. Well, okay, what have we got here? Um, discount factors. At year zero, of course, one and one. Four years at 5%. Something like 3.546 and 3.170. Year 4 at 5%, 0 0.823. Year 4 at 10%, 0 0.683. So we can get all of this sort of information. We pull it out of the tables, throw it straight in. Once we've got this, we multiply out 120 and 120. 3.546 multiplied by 7, something like 24.82. 3.170 multiplied by 7, something like 22.19. multiplied by 120, 98.76, I think. And 0.683 multiplied by 120, something like 81.96. So, we've run the numbers. Given that we've run the numbers, we can get our net present values. Focusing on the net present value, right, so what do we get? We get a net present value here of something like plus 3.58. And we get a net present value here of something like minus 0.15.85. Right, we got those numbers, we simply shove them straight into the formula. Well, if we're looking at KD, L equals 5 plus NL, what do we say? 3.58 over NL, 3.58 minus NH, minus a minus is a plus, 15.85. We multiply by H minus L. H minus L gives us 5%, something like that. And therefore, we're able to establish the cost of debt. We get to something like a cost of debt of 5.92%. And the issue is, in the exam, we'll be all very happy, wouldn't we? All relaxed. Yeah, we can get the right answer. The trouble is, and what I've been trying to highlight with this whole question is, yes, we can get the right answer. But unfortunately here, we'll be wasting a lot of time. Let's just look back at the information that we had. What we're seeing is this idea. The market value today and the eventual redemption value are the same values. And if they're the same values, you don't need to do what we've done here. In fact, doing what we've done here is a complete waste of time. I don't know if you remember earlier, we talked about the idea of irredeemable debt. And we said that irredeemable debt doesn't happen, but the irredeemable debt formula may be used for a trick. Well, now we've just found the trick. The trick is simply this. If the market value and the residual value are the same thing, we could get the right answer by using the irredeemable debt formula. If you wish, in the example we just got here, we could say KD equals the interest, 7, I believe, over the market value, 120, and I think what you get is 5.83%. You could say that the numbers are not the same, 
But in actual fact, this is the number that is more accurate. Because remember, interpolation, the interpolation formula, always tends to slightly overstate the IRR. Now, I don't really care, and neither does the examiner, if you get a slightly different number. That's expected. What I do care about is this. Using the irredeemable debt formula is far, far quicker. So if you're given redemption value and market value the same, you've got to use the irredeemable debt formula. You know, I1 minus T divided by PO, bang, job done, rather than waste a lot of time and effort going step by step through. So let's just go back. I said that there was a little trick here, and that is use if the market value equals the redemption value. That's the deal. And that should be a nice little trick, because if it comes up and you pick up on it, you're immediately feeling good as you see other people working so hard on something that they will not get credit for. Now we can look at dealing with convertible debt. Now, what's the whole point of convertible debt? Well, the issue about convertible debt is that the debt holder has the choice. They can either choose to convert or redeem the debt. Now, they are going to base that choice on the value of the debt on conversion or the value of the debt on redemption. Whichever is higher is the one that they'll go for. So when we deal with convertible debt and calculating KD, it's not a big issue. All we have to remember is to make that choice first of all. Once we've made that choice, all we do is to take either the redemption value or the conversion value that we choose, throw it in to our seven columns, and Bob's your uncle, you're sorted. So, okay, let's look at a question and see maybe how this would work. If we look at a question in the notes, example 15, do deck. Dudek has convertible low notes in issue that may be redeemed at a 10% premium to par value in four years. The coupon is 10%. Remember, coupon means interest rate. It's just another term for it. And the current market value is $95. Fine. Now the fun bit. Alternatively, the loans may be converted at that date. Yeah, what the examiner tends to do is to either convert or redeem at the same date, because otherwise it may become quite complicated. Into 25 ordinary shares, and the current value of the shares is $4. And they're expected to appreciate in value by 6% per annum. Well, okay. That's our example. Let's see how it works. Remember, the first thing we have to do is to make the choice. And remember, the choice is made by the debt holder. Therefore, they will always go for the higher of either conversion value or redemption value. So, we have a choice. We want to look at either the conversion value or the redemption value. Now, what were we told about the conversion value? How many shares was it? Well, yes, we said that we could convert one debenture into 25 shares. And each share is currently valued at four dollars. No, no problem there. But of course that gives us a current value and what we want is a conversion value four years down the line. We're told that shares are expected to appreciate by six percent per year. So a simple bit of compounding here, we multiply by one plus r to the power n. One plus r, six percent, 
to the power n, the number of years, 4. Right, we bring this all together. And we establish that the conversion value is 126.25. Then we have to think about the redemption value. And it's a very simple one here. We are told that they're redeemed at a 10% premium to par value. So hold on a moment. If par value is 100, we're going to increase it by 10%. There we go, $110. Now, all we have to do is choose. Now, the simple fact is, I'm a bit of a cynic about these things. If it's convertible debt, I'm pretty sure that your examiner will want to convert. And in this example, that's exactly what he wants to do. In simple terms, the conversion value is substantially better than the redemption value. So, we've done the first bit, fine. And remember what I said, once I've got that number, I pick it up and throw it into the seven columns. Come on then, let's blast through the seven columns and see how it works. We've got our years, we've got our cash flow, we've got our 5% discount factors, and we've got our 10% discount factors. Discount factors and present values, discount factors and present values. Well, okay, we've done all this before, but it's the sort of thing that you must practice again and again. It's not the issue that you have to be able to do it. The issue is that you have to be able to do it quickly and accurately each and every time. So, what have we got? Year zero, we've got the current market value. Years one through four, didn't we say, there was interest. And year four, there is, well, to be pedantic, the conversion value. We're going to convert rather than redeem. Now, if we look at the market value, it was 95, and we make that negative. The interest was 10%. Um, and although it was left out of the question, I would always expect tax to be there, so I put tax in there. We have interest of 7, and we have the conversion value of 126.25. Not too difficult, I hope. Right, we've got that far, now we want the discount factors. Year 0 is 1. Year four, four years at 5%, 3.546 and 3.120. Year four at 5% comes to 0.823 and 0.683. We've got all the numbers, let's just bash the numbers through. What have we got? Minus 95 and minus 95 plus 24.82 and plus 21.84 and 103.90 and 86.23 this should be becoming a mechanical exercise and no more here okay let's establish our net present value what have we got minus 95 plus 24.82, plus 103.9, we get to something like plus 33.72. 10%, minus this, plus this, plus this. Oh, they're both positive. Oh. What do we do? They're both positive. That's not fair. If they're both positive, what does that mean? Well, I suppose it means that not only is the cost of debt higher than 5%, it's also higher than 10%. Now, the simple fact is, if this happens in the exam, which it may, you have not got time to think through what's going on. Instead, you bash the numbers in, and your answer, although maybe not as good as it could be, will be perfectly acceptable. Just get on with it. So, 
If we're looking at KD, it's simple as this. KD is L, 5% plus NL, 33.72. Over NL, 33.72. Ah, minus NH. Because NH is positive, when we take it away, we do take it away. And then we multiply by 10 minus 5. And that gives us KD of something like 13.16%. That would be fine. It's not maybe as good as it possibly could be, but I'm sorry, from an ACCA perspective, they're not going to worry. It's good enough to use in the next bit of the computation. So, we dealt with our convertible debt. And I don't think that that was too difficult at all. Remember, do your choice, first of all, from the perspective of the debt holder, and once you've done your choice, then slap it into your seven columns. Right, let's move on. Let's now look at bank debt. Now, the issue about bank debt is this. It is non-tradable. Now, from that perspective, we don't have a change in the market value up or down. So you don't get hung up about your bank debt. All you have to remember is that KD is very straightforward. KD is simply going to be the interest rate, I suppose I could have called it the coupon rate, multiplied by 1 minus T. 1 minus the tax rate. Nothing could be easier. So, if we look through our notes and pick out an example, what have we got here? Triori. Example 16. Triori has a loan from the bank at 12% per annum. Okay, it's all we know. Corpse tax is 30%. Oh, is that all we're given? <laughs> Not too difficult, I hope. So hold on, let's just do it here. There's no point getting too excited. 12% multiplied by 1 minus 0.3. Hey presto, abracadabra, we've got a non-tradable debt value. Was that too difficult? Well, I don't think it was. So this sort of area is something that you can do. Okay? Make sure you practice all of these areas. And any formula that is not given in your formula sheet, you make sure you know. In fact, one of my great piece of it, pieces of advice, from my perspective at least, is this. You learn to use your formula sheet, but very importantly, you build up in your mind a further formula sheet for all of those formulae or pro formas that you're not given. Our final bit of fun here is with regard to preference shares. Now, when we look at preference shares, yes, we know that the return relates to the dividend. But what is the critical feature that differentiates a dividend with a preference share with a dividend in an ordinary share? Well, yes, the critical feature is that preference share dividends are not expected to change. Yes. The dividends are fixed, typically as a percentage of the issue price of the share. Now, from that perspective, this makes life incredibly easy. If we want KP, the cost of a preference share, can't we go back to the very early perpetuity formula that we had, where there was no growth? And couldn't we simply say that KP is going to equal D over PO, the dividend, which will not change, over the price of the share? Well, that's it. That's all we have to do. It's only a one marker, but let's make sure we get it. Um, therefore, what have we got here? Haman's 9% preference shares are currently traded at $1.4 x-div. Do you remember that trick? 
everything we do must be x div. So from that perspective, couldn't we say that kp equals 9%, what's that, 9 cents, over $1.4, well, okay, we won't get caught out there, 140 cents, and that gives us something like 6.4%. So this is a rocky science. We can do this. And what we've managed to do now is we've looked at all of the components that we need for the cost of capital. We've looked at KE and a number of ways of calculating that. You know, dividend valuation model and things like CAPM. We've looked at KD and we've looked at all the varieties. We've looked at irredeemable redeemable, convertible, these sort of things, oh, bank loans. And we've also looked at KP, preference shares. And these are the sort of tools that you need in your toolbox, yeah? You've got to be able to pull them out and say, I can do that, I can do that. Uh, on that basis, you can pick up the marks. We know that the cost of capital is going to be examined heavily. Now, let's move on. So what we now want to look at is something called the WAC. something called the weighted average cost of capital. Now, we're going to see in a moment when we can use this and what we use this for. But before we do that, let's go straight to an example and understand how it all works. Looking at the example, Barros has 20 million ordinary 25p shares quoted at $3 and $8 million worth of loan notes quoted at $85. The cost of equity has already been calculated at 15%, and the cost of debt, 7.6% net of tax, which is what we normally want. Now, the whole point about weighted average cost of capital is that it does what it says on the tin. So all we have to do is to get a weighted average. Presumably, weighting the cost of equity and the cost of debt by some measure of value, given up here and here. Now, I must point out that your examiner gives you a formula. So you have something like this. The WAC equals VE, the value of equity, over VE plus VD, multiplied by KE, plus VD over VE plus VD multiplied by KD. Now, that's all well and good. It does work, no problem with that. The only issue is that I'm looking to do it more quickly, particularly if you get more than two components, because this is all well and good if you've just got VE and VD. If, however, if, however, you've got maybe... KP as well, and various other bits and pieces, it's slightly more awkward to deal with. Let's just look at maybe how I would go about it. You see, I'm always looking for very simple ways of doing things, you know, so even I can get them right, well, on a good day. And my thought is simply this. We know that we're looking at V, value, and we're looking at K, cost. And what we want is to bring them together, VK. So all I do is I do a working for value cost and value multiplied by cost. So let's have a look-see. We want the value and cost associated with equity. And we wanted the value and cost associated with debt. If we're looking at the value of equity, let's go back to what's there and see what we can uh, establish. The value of equity. Well, I suppose we're looking at the market value. And the market value is $3. So to get the value of equity, can't we just take that and multiply by the number of shares? Simple as that. So identify the number of shares, maybe from the balance sheet in some examples, multiply by the current market value, and hey presto, you've got your job done. So we said 20 million shares at $3 each. Oh, should we put everything in millions just for fun? And we've got 60 million. 
not rocket science. Right, so we've got our equity value. What about debt? Well, if we're looking at debt, let's just go back and see what information is given for debt. Ah, so we're given eight million dollars worth of loans. When you're given that figure, that is in book value terms. So we've got eight million book value, and what we want to do is to establish its market value. Well, if you remember, debt is quoted at a par or nominal value of $100. And what we're told here is that they are currently trading, they're quoted at $85. So couldn't we do this sort of thing? Couldn't we say, well, hold on a moment. We've got $8 million worth of debt at par or nominal value. If we multiply by market value, 85, over nominal value, 100, then we get, what, something like 6.8 million? And therefore, we have the sum of V, 66.8, something very important. Once we've got that, well, what other information do we need? We've now got KE and KD. Slap them straight in, 15, 7.6%. So, KE, 0.15 or 15%, yeah? KD, 0 0.076 or 7.6%, no problem. Multiply across. 60 multiplied by 0.15, what does that come to? 9? Well, what we could do is what? Multiply the debt, 6.8 million, by 0 0.076. And we get something like 0.517. Right, if we've got that, we can sum V multiplied by K. If we do, do so, 9.517, the total amount. Now, how do we calculate the WAC? Well, couldn't we simply say the WAC is something like this? We take the V multiplied by K, the amount we expect to generate per annum, 9.517, divided by 66.8, the overall value. And we end up with something like 14.25%. And I like doing the WAC this way. I like it because I think it's easy to visualize what's going on. Therefore, you can see very quickly if you're making a silly mistake. But more importantly, if the examiner wants to make it slightly more complicated, we can list as many different components and sum the value, the value multiplied by the cost, and of course, Bosch, we've got our WAC computation. I think it works, I think it's simple. And I'm always looking for simple ways to deal with a more complex problem. Okay? Right. So, we've looked at cost of debt. We've looked at cost of equity. KP, cost of preference shares. We've also looked at the WAC. We've got the basic cost of capital already nailed. Now, what do we use this WAC for? Well, maybe this brings us back to what we talked about at the very beginning. If you remember, we talked about the accounting equation. And on the one hand, we had, on the one hand, we had the funds, debt plus equity, and on the other hand, we have the application of funds, you know, non-current assets and working capital. And what we're effectively saying is this, the debt and the equity cost us money. By establishing the WAC, we establish the overall average of the cost of debt and equity. We can then apply that for investment appraisal purposes. So if we're looking at the use of the WAC, the key use is simply investment appraisal. Of course, what we're saying is that the WAC is the discount rate. Now, the issue is we can only do this in certain circumstances. So, 
the requirements for use are these. Firstly, it's a relatively small investment. Okay, so the investment itself is relatively insignificant in relation to the size of the business. If it were a significant investment, the investment itself would affect the overall WAC because it would have an effect on all components that we've already used. Secondly, that we use pooled funds. Well, I suppose the deal is simply this. What we're saying is that there is a pool of funds that is generated for investment purposes. Maybe on the basis that we spend five million a year on investments, we raise five million pounds worth and then it is dispersed for each investment. This is separate to maybe where individual investments are financed separately. You know, each individual investment we would have to raise finance for. So, pooled funds approach. Thirdly, the capital structure is unchanged. What we're looking at here is the mix of debt to equity. Now, of course, this would have an impact. We've calculated the weighted average cost of capital. And, of course, the, if the weighting differed, uh, the underlying values of debt and values of equity would differ. But more than that, something that we'll see in the future is that the, the change in the capital structure may have an impact not just on VE and VD, but also KE and KD. So... The capital structure is unchanged. And finally, the risk profile is similar to the company's risk profile. Now, don't be surprised if these were asked by the examiner. These are the requirements if we wish to use the WAC as our discount rate. What we will find is that if we do not have these requirements met, we have to use another methodology. And based on what the examiner has written in his articles, I'm inclined to believe that it's this final area here, which is the area that the examiner is going to get excited about. It's all going to be about risk profile, so be ready for it.